<laughs> this may not be the most elegant way to start a film about the serious issues of apartheid and discrimination, but I really need to get on this horse so that I can ride with Iraj Abedia, one of South Africa's most prominent economists. Okay. So I hold this sort of lightly, right? Very light. Look. Okay, just relax. Yeah. If you don't relax, the horse won't relax. Sure, no, I'm relaxing. <laughs> Ish. How does it, how would it go? Just nick, give it a nick. Yeah. He'll follow me most probably. I am Arash Azizi, an Iranian journalist in exile. We are in Coffee Bay, about a thousand kilometers south of Johannesburg. Iraj migrated to South Africa from Iran in 1980. While studying at the University of Cape Town, he has started researching the economic development of rural areas in the trans region during apartheid, when the white minority ruled over black and colored South Africans. So in 1980s, you came here for the villages, 1981? 1981. Having come from Iran, the interesting part was to understand the society to which I had arrived try to learn from it, to understand the culture. So you wanted yourself to come in the middle of a place where there was no electricity in most parts. There yeah. was, this was really rural back then. It was and rural. And apartheid made sure that it was. Absolutely, apartheid had neglected it. It was uh, no, no industry, no electricity, no reticulations. And all of that meant they were in a way condemned to stay small, stay subsistence, and, and stay within the struggling economy. Through my conversations with Iraj and other people here, I want to understand the cost of discrimination, not only in South Africa, but also in Iran. Iraj is in a unique position to talk about this issue. He's experienced discrimination firsthand. Iraj is a Baha'i, which is Iran's largest religious minority. The way the Baha'is are suppressed in Iran today is much like how the apartheid regime subjugated the majority of South Africans from 1948 to 1994. Non-European South Africans were subjected to arbitrary laws and policies that blocked their economic and educational progress. Thousands of blacks and colored people were tortured and murdered by the apartheid regime. 7,000 miles north of South Africa, the Islamic government in Iran has been treating some of its citizens in a similar way. Hundreds of Baha'is have been killed since 1979. Baha'i cemeteries have been desecrated, and the Baha'is have been denied educational and economic opportunities because of their faith. The apartheid regime drove thousands of talented South Africans into exile. This also happened in Iran, and it's still happening today. I want to ask you something as an Iranian that I often thought about. You know, when I was a young student in Iran, one of the things needed in Iran were economists who had worked on development. And when I talk to people in South Africa, and they talk about one of their best economic advisors as you, I think of, isn't the cost of discrimination here clear when a government stops a citizen like Iraj to go and save their own country because of their religion, isn't it all of us who get hurt? With respect, uh, uh, there are many, many thousands of Iranians, talent and professionals in different fields who, Baha'i or non-Baha'i, are denied uh, making a contribution to the development of their own nation. Um, so without a doubt, uh, you deny the talents and the, and the resources of a nation. Not just that particular targeted group suffers, the entire nation suffers. In fact, the parallel in that area in South Africa is so strong. The whites who denied black majority development, scientific growth, access to opportunities, now, even 25 years later, the entire nation suffers the consequences. And in my humble view, it will take at least another two generations before the consequences of apartheid is expunged out of out of South Africa. So it's, there's a heavy price to discrimination. In the early 1980s, when Iraj moved to South Africa, the Baha'is were so brutally persecuted that they were featured regularly in American media. The tragedy of the Baha'is persecuted in Iran in the name of Islam. 
the Baha'is of a worldwide religious faith. In general, the Baha'is practice a gentle faith that advocates meeting violence with serenity. Sixteen members of the Baha'is that we know about were hanged. They were part of a group of 22 for whom President Reagan had pled for mercy. Bob, does our government's protest make any difference? Well, apparently not, Barbara. Another 22 Baha'is were arrested just last week. Members of the Baha'i faith say it's a question of genocide. And the alleged perpetrator of the genocide is the government of Iran. A case of religious genocide unique at this moment on this planet. The fundamentalist Muslim government in Iran has displayed an intense hatred of the Baha'is that stems in part from how the tenets of the faith differ from Islam, sometimes radically. Among other things, the Baha'is believe in equality of the sexes, eventual world government, universal education, and in practicing their religion without clergy, all concepts that have infuriated Iran's leaders. Back in Johannesburg, I had dinner with some South African Baha'is. There are 7 million Baha'is around the world, including almost 250,000 in South Africa. A Baha'i gathering like this would have been illegal during apartheid because whites and blacks are interacting and breaking bread together. And guests at this dinner could also end up in jail in Iran because most of them are Baha'is. In South Africa, it was a very unique situation in apartheid because the minority was discriminating the majority. Majority is the one that suffered. But in Iran, any body who's belonging to minority groups is discriminated. To an extent, again, the suffering and the outcomes are the same. Discrimination is discrimination, injustice is injustice. Like their South African friends, many of the Iranian guests at this dinner have experienced discrimination. Nika Wafai is a face surgeon. Her family came to South Africa in the late 1970s before she was born. So my grandfather, his name was Rahmatullah Wafai. He had a shop in Mardasht in Iran uh, where he would sell um, goods. He was part of the Baha'i community uh, in, his, um, in, in Mardasht. And um, he, he was living with his wife, my grandmother, and their son at the time. Rahmatullah Wafai was among hundreds of Baha'is who were arrested after the revolution. Their only crime was practicing their faith. The prisoners were subjected to physical and psychological torture to recant their faith and convert to Islam. They were told not to talk about this torture with their loved ones. If they did, their visiting privileges would be taken away from them. It was a very emotional time. It was very difficult, more because they would keep my grandmother in the dark about most of the information, where they were keeping him, what, how they were treating him. Of course, they knew, um, you know, as Baha'is, how the Baha'is were treated in prison. Uh, so it was very difficult for them. And of course, when she would go visit my grandfather, he would put on a brave face and try, um, you know, console her. Uh, as much as he was suffering, she would, he would not show that suffering to her. Rahmatullah Wafai was executed on March 12, 1983. More than 200 Baha'is were murdered in Iran between 1979 and 1987. In many cases, the executioners desecrated the dead bodies of Baha'is with Islamic slogans. Do you consider Baha'is to be heretics? I think they are sacrilegious. They are heretics. What do you mean by heretics? Heretics in the sense of... It is not a, a religion. I, I told you. I consider it as a political, uh, a, a treacherous political movement. Iranian officials deny mistreating the Baha'is. But this interview clearly shows the attitude of the Islamic government toward the Baha'is. Generally, among the leaders, we had a good number of them uh, who were agents of uh, America or Israel. And they were executed? So, oh, yes. It, it, it had nothing to do with uh, Baha'ism. It just happened that we had among Muslims also people who have been executed. I was born in 1988, nine years after the revolution. 
but my childhood was filled with stories of the torture and execution of our friends and relatives. Whenever I passed by the notorious Evin prison, where thousands of innocent Iranians, Baha'is and others, were murdered, I dreamed that one day it would become a relic of the past, a museum where we could understand our history and work together for a better future. This is happening in South Africa. The Apartheid Museum in Johannesburg tries to give visitors a personal experience of apartheid. Dr. Salim Nakhchawani studied law at Cambridge University. He's worked for the International Criminal Court in several countries. He's also an Iranian Baha'i. The lessons that can be drawn comparing Iran to South Africa, very different cultures, very different people, very different social contexts, but the desire of the system to entrench itself and to exercise a kind of domination over the will of people is the same across the board. And the methods used to do it, we see right here uh, in the Apartheid Museum. The use of identity cards, cataloging, classifying and sub-classifying, effectively allowing the individual to choose how to act and how to serve their community is something that should be controlled. It should be restricted, it should be directed. Um, instead of allowing that to be a free expression of what it is to be a human being. Of course, it was not only the Africans who were suppressed during apartheid. The regime labeled some people from Asian, African, and even European backgrounds colored and subjected them to discrimination. Well, I can start by saying that there were four colored classifications. Malay colored, uh, other colored, colored, uh, uh, Cape Colored, I think four. Leonard Mackenzie worked with whites and Africans throughout his life, but because of his skin color, he tried to stay away from white areas to avoid harassment. You, uh, in many ways, had to, as far as possible, stay away from white areas. For instance, you would be walking around town and they come out of a pub. They could easily beat you up and nothing would come of it. So we knew how far to go and not to go. You couldn't go to a restaurant that's for whites. You couldn't go to a park that's for whites. You couldn't, in some instances, you couldn't even go to a church that's for whites even though you're of the same denomination. What is it that makes the systems to create an other certain group of people and discriminate against them? Why is that idea so useful for them? Well, when you think about it, it's a very simple, but it's proven to be a frighteningly effective strategy, right? What you do is you want to stay in control. So you, need an, you think you need an enemy because you think that if there is an external threat to you, external to your own community, you will be able to maintain your dominance of that community. Eugene Hamas grew up in an Afrikaner Christian family. Like many white South Africans, he didn't like to be called superior simply thanks to the color of his skin. I think I understood as a, as, as, as a young man already that Various groups and various cultures have their own unique contribution to make. And that when we separate ourselves from others, we miss out. We maybe um, can argue, and that argument is still being made, you know, that the system of apartheid was there to economically benefit white people. But socially, artistically, and um, so many other levels, I think we were being impoverished. To sell prejudice to a group of people, you need to convince them that they are better than others. Both the Iranian government and the apartheid regime have used religion to justify their policies. At high school in Iran, we were taught that Ayatollah Khomeini's interpretation of Islam was the only righteous path, and that the Baha'is were heretics because they believe in the Prophet Baha'u'llah as the latest Prophet of God. Because of that, 
Baha'is are treated as second-class citizens. South African Dutch Reformed pastors also use their interpretation of the Bible to degrade non-Europeans and justify bigotry. By far the largest church denomination in the Union of South Africa is the Dutch Reformed Church. With us this morning is Secretary of the Federal Council of Dutch Reformed Churches. How many burger you believe in apartheid as a way of life? Yes, I do. Why? In South Africa. Why is that, sir? Uh, because the race which is in a, a lesser state of development is by far in the majority here. And numerically, of course, they are much stronger. And because also I believe that it is according to God's will that the white race which is in the majority in this country, should be preserved. And also, everything we have done in the last 300 years and built up in the church and in the state should be preserved and not be swallowed up by an, I wouldn't say inferior race, because it, I don't believe it is an inferior race, but a lesser a, a, a race which is in a lesser state of development. You would find that the, the church would focus more on, on the Old Testament passages. You know, they would, um, for instance, say that um, the black people in South Africa was descendants of Ham and were water uh, carriers and wood choppers, you know, because that is what those descendants were, were cursed to be for the rest of their um, eternity and that there was God's people and well you know and basically the rest which implicitly I suppose meant that they were the devil's people. I considered anything and everything that had to do with Christianity as white as, uh, as white and white as oppressive and I thought this God that the white man is worshipping is a white man's God and I can't see myself worshipping the same God as my enemy. I consider him an enemy, no longer just another person. To be hated by someone with no reason, if a person hates you with no reason, I mean, how else can you consider him? This exploitation of religion to justify discrimination and injustice drove many Africans away from the Reformed Church. In Soweto, a bastion of the anti-apartheid movement, I visited the Land of Joy Community Center, where local grandparents gather every day. It was not true that they do all this in the name of Jesus, it wasn't. Because the very same uh, Dutch Reformed Church is very discriminatory. They didn't want black people in their church. They didn't, even now, even now. These people are using the name of God and Christ, but they are doing things that they are unlike religion. Yes, it was very bad, you know to the extent that I didn't believe that they are really religious. You didn't, you didn't believe no. they were Christian? Yes, yes, yes. They were just using it for, because they were in power then. The founding religious members of apartheid perverted Christianity for a particular end, political control and political ideology. Exactly as it was the case with apartheid, the Iranian regime has perverted Islam, its principles, um, in order to shape its political ideology and enforce it on Iran. It's anything but religion, anything but godliness. Um, it's uh, nothing more than a perverted 
and distorted interpretation of Islam for self-enrichment and political power. The Iranian government stopped killing the Baha'is in large numbers in the mid-1980s, but they imposed new measures against the minority, some subtle and some not so subtle. This secret document, signed by Iran's supreme leader, says that Baha'is must be expelled from universities once it becomes known that they are Baha'is. There were mass detentions and executions of Baha'is from the beginning of the regime. But I think there, there has been a shift to other means, definitely, um, where uh, economic means and social means have largely taken the place of executions. There continue to be detentions, extrajudicial detentions, but uh, other means are, are used now, and denial of, of the right to education is a principal one. Blocking the means of economic progress is another one. For this reason, I think uh, many around the world have started to use the expression economic apartheid. Since the 1979 Islamic Revolution, Baha'is have been barred from higher education. Baha'is are not allowed to teach or study in Iranian universities. In fact, this form of educational apartheid has become one of the main ways to obstruct the progress of the Baha'is in Iran. So, the Baha'is of Iran started their own informal university called the BIHE, the Baha'i Institute for Higher Education. When the Iranian regime banned the Baha'i youth from access to tertiary education, um, it was natural that the Baha'i community would have to find a substitute. They would have to find a response, a peaceful and constructive response to the uh, inability to access national universities. BIHE classes are held in people's homes. Some classes are taught in person, and others are taught online by teachers like Iraj, who teaches economics at BIHE. We can't show you the faces of these students because security agents regularly harass BIHE students and teachers. Well, BIHE is, uh, is a real university, is a real tertiary level um, school system. And it's in recognition of the fact that human beings need to be educated under all conditions. Not only from a fact that it's a human rights issue, but human progress can only really mature if human beings are allowed and given environment to be educated under all conditions. Once again, the story of the denial of education to the Baha'is in Iran is similar to how, in 1953, the apartheid regime created an inferior educational system called Bantu Education for Africans. The apartheid government passed a law called Bantu Education Act. The aim was that a black person must be less educated. He must just be educated enough to be able to communicate with the master. Uh, but that has affected our education because the main aim was just that we could speak a bit and count a bit. I think the situation in Iran blocking the access of young, capable Baha'is to tertiary education is in some ways similar to what we had here in South Africa. Of course, the Africans here were streamed into Bantu education from their earliest infancy. Baha'is in primary schools may face discrimination in Iran. They're not completely barred from education. But that Access to tertiary education, when you think about it, how essential it is for the full development of the potential of a person. And I mean, that's exactly what the Bantu education system tried to do in South Africa as well, to say, you are 
your progress should be blocked. The Baha'is are being told the same thing in Iran. In the 1960s, when the father of apartheid, Hendrik Fairford, told the world, we are here to stay, I am sure many young South Africans hoped one day the apartheid regime would become a relic of the past. We are here to stay. We have, for a very long time, developed in South Africa a nation of our own. Friendly, prosperous, progressive. We hope that the rest of Africa will become likewise. Apartheid fell in 1990 after Nelson Mandela was freed. A year later, the apartheid legislation was abolished. At the end of the day, democracies survive, economies prosper when the nations manage to coalesce around, around doing the right thing on their very top signals. After the introduction of democracy, Iraj worked with Nelson Mandela and Thabo Mbeki to try and rebuild the South African economy. The effect of apartheid manifests itself in many, many different fronts. One of the costs that apartheid imposed on South Africa was that it didn't develop its human resources. So even when it's liberated, it takes two, dec two decades and more to catch up. The resources were used to suppress, as opposed to, unlock people's potential and help development, educate people. The limited resources of the country were being used for spying on people, for torturing people, for running massive prisons, for developing new techniques for torturing people. Apartheid was at the forefront of it. These were the costs that ultimately brought the structure down, ultimately bankrupted the system. At the turn of regime in 1994, and literally and technically the South African government was fiscally unviable. Now the same in many ways applies to, to the situation in Iran. The majority of Iranian human resources are underdeveloped these days but they are using limited resources of the country to police people. Look at the size of the police, look at the size of the army, look at the amount of money that is spent on uh, military forces in the region. That is a cost to the societies, not cost to those who have been affected by prejudice or targeted for elimination. That's a cost that everybody pays. When I see that my own brothers and sisters in Iran, and in that I mean the Baha'is and those who are not Baha'is, I mean the population of the country, are in a sense being blocked in their progress as a society. It, it creates in my heart a, a, a longing and a hope, for sure. Um, and I'm sorry, this is very... But I... Sorry. We'll have better days. Another similarity between the apartheid regime and the Islamic government in Iran is the political infighting that undermines their own authority. Politicians in Iran today attack each other as vehemently as apartheid officials did in the past. And as usual, the victims are the ordinary citizens. In the last decade of apartheid, one of the interesting indicators that the system was imploding was that um, the, the leaders of apartheid began to turn on each other. Uh, the party split four times. Um, the cohesion was literally eroding on a daily basis. Well, if I compare what happened in the late 80s in South Africa and compare what's happening in Iran, I see exactly the same cracks appearing. 
So I'm not at all pessimistic about the future of Iran. After spending more than a month in South Africa and witnessing the long-term effect of apartheid on this magnificent country, I can see that discrimination is like cancer. It does not sit in one organ. It has spreads through the whole body, destroying everything, even the parts that you thought might be immune. The apartheid regime never understood this. I can only hope that Iranian rulers can learn from history. Never and never again shall it be that this beautiful land will again experience the oppression of one by another. The time for the healing of the wounds has come. The moment to bridge the chasms that divide us has come. The time to build is upon us.